Hello, it's five o'clock burn time. Welcome all of you to today's talk in EC's Game Changer series. I am Joachim Wamskans, Director for Astrophysics and Cosmology at EC and your host today. EC, the International Space Science Institute in Bern, Switzerland, celebrates its 25th anniversary this year. For a quarter of a century, EC has served the space science community by offering various tools for scientists to meet in Bern and jointly do science related to space missions. Currently, physical meetings in Bern are not possible, so we try to create a couple of new ways for scientists to collaborate, interact, and exchange information. The EC Game Changer series is one of these new tools where we look at missions that change the game in the space sciences. We started in late July and have had about a dozen talks on missions to planets, dwarf planets, comets, and the sun itself, like Cassini, Juno, Rosetta, or Ulysses. Two weeks ago, we had a talk on Integral, starting the astrophysical and cosmology missions. Last week, the Gaia mission was the topic of the Easy Game Changer series. In case you missed some of our previous talks, they were recorded and can be viewed on the Easy website. Before I introduce today's speaker, let me announce ne next week's talk, Jan Tauber from ESA, the European Space Agency in Nordwijk, will talk about the cosmology mission Planck, Planck from the early universe to our local environment. Let me come to today's talk now. Tom Brown is the speaker. Tom is the Hubble mission head at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, the Science Operations Center for the Hubble Space Telescope. He attended the Pennsylvania State University and got a bachelor's degree there in, with majors in physics and astrophysics. Then he joined Johns Hopkins University and got a master's degree and his PhD in astrophysics there. He has previously worked with the Astro 2 Space Shuttle mission, two Hubble instruments, and the James Webb Space Telescope. Tom's research focuses on galaxy formation and stellar evolution. His recent research highlights include evidence that reionization quenched the star formation nearby dwarf galaxies and measurement of the first precise parallax for an ancient star cluster. The title of today's talk is The Hubble Space Telescope from Cosmological Conflict to Alien Atmospheres. Thanks, Tom, for agreeing to give a talk. The stage is yours. All right, thank you. Should I share my screen now? Yes, please. Okay. And... Oh, it says uh, screen sailing has failed to, failed to start. One second, let me try again. <laughs> it worked right before we did this. All right. Can you see it now? Yes, we see it. <clears throat> OK, very good. Uh, all right, thank you for having me. Uh, again, uh, my name is Tom Brown. And I work at the Space Telescope Science Institute, where I'm the Hubble mission head. And I'll be talking to you today about the broad range of science we do with the Hubble Space Telescope. So Hubble was launched in 1990, over 30 years ago, and was subsequently serviced in five servicing missions throughout the 90s and 2000s. There are no additional servicing missions planned at the moment, but we fully expect the observatory to be scientifically operational through at least 2026, and with a good chance of lasting throughout the 2020s. This is a little overview here of the physical characteristics of the observatory, for those of you who are not familiar with it. Hubble is roughly the size of a school bus uh, with a length a little over 13 meters, uh, width at its widest point over four meters, and a weight of over 12,000 kilograms. Uh, it's a Cassegrain telescope with a 2.4 meter primary and a 0.3 meter secondary. It's in low Earth orbit at 350 kilometers. It goes around the Earth at once every 95 minutes. And we expect that orbit to be stable till about 2041. Uh, depending upon solar activity, those predictions can vary. The earliest the stability might be, a concern would be 2034, and the latest it would be 2049. But we expect the, total, the orbit to be stable until 2041. And then it receives power through both solar arrays and batteries on board. This is an overview of the instrumentation on Hubble. Uh, these are the current operational instruments shown on the, the left-hand side here. I'll go through them quickly. Uh, first, there's the Cosmic Origin Spectrograph, which was installed in the last service commission. It looks in the far and near ultraviolet. 
It's optimized for ultraviolet spectroscopy of faint point sources. Complementing those capabilities is the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph, or STIS. It was installed in 1997 and then repaired in 2009. It has three channels, uh, ranging from the far ultraviolet through the near infrared. And it's a more versatile spectrograph with many different modes for both imaging and spectroscopy of both point sources and extended sources. So it's not quite as sensitive as COS, but it does have more versatility. So depending upon the science program, you may use one or the other. Uh, the next instrument is the Advanced Camera for Surveys. It was installed in 2002. Uh, that was an enormous leap forward in the imaging capabilities of Hubble, much more sensitive than previous instruments. It was at that time that Hubble images began showing distant galaxies in pretty much every picture Hubble took, whether it was something near or far. Uh, it has two operating channels, one in the ultraviolet and one in the optical and near infrared. It provides wide field imaging, slit spectroscopy, and it has an emphasis on optical and red throughput sensitivity. And then there's the Wide Field Camera 3, which was installed in 2009 in the last servicing mission. It has two channels. One works in the optical through the near infrared, and one is exclusively working in the near infrared. It provides panchromatic imaging, slit spectroscopy, and astrometry. And it again complements the ACS camera <clears throat> because the ACS camera is optimized to be more sensitive in the red, whereas the C3 is more in the blue. Uh, finally, we have a fine guidance sensor package which was launched with the telescope and then upgraded over the years. Uh, it's mainly used for part of the pointing control system, although you can do astrometric science with it to get a 0.2 milli arc second relative astrometry or binary detect detection. But these days, most astrom astrometry is done with wide field camera three. There's a dormant instrument as well called NICMOS, which was installed in 1997, uh, but it ceased operations in 2008 due to difficulties with its cryocooler and because wide field camera three came online. The Hubble instruments provide unique capabilities. Uh, and I'm demonstrating that here. Here's an image of what a crowded star field would look like from a ground-based observatory with atmospheric blurring uh, from a typical observatory. <clears throat> and then here's what you get with Hubble with high contrast and resolution throughout the ultraviolet optical and infrared range. Uh, Hubble has a resolution of about 0.05 arc seconds at 500 nanometers. Hubble also provides crucial diagnostics in the ultraviolet. Uh, as you know, the atmosphere is opaque in the ultraviolet below 300 nanometers. I'm showing here two spectra. Uh, this is energy versus wavelength for stars at 24,000 degrees and 8,000 degrees. And you can see those spectra diverge quite dramatically below 300 nanometers. And that's because uh, the ultraviolet is really where you get a good handle on temperatures in astrophysics. And then also the divots in the spectrum there are from metal absorption features that are prominent in the ultraviolet. The ultraviolet provides a unique handle on chemistry as well. And those diagnostics are primarily available at the shortest wavelengths accessible by Hubble. And for these reasons, Hubble remains in high demand uh, synergistically with other observatories because of its unique ultraviolet capabilities. Hubble science spans the breadth of astrophysical phenomena. <clears throat> I'm showing you here on the left a uh, pie chart of the different science topics at a high level being explored by the observatory in the current observing cycle. And you can see it covers black holes, exoplanets, galaxies, the intergalactic medium and circumgalactic medium, large scale structure and cosmology, solar systems, stellar physics, and stellar populations. On the right, I'm showing the scientific productivity of the telescope as measured in refereed papers per year. So this is not a cumulative graph. This is uh, the publications each year. Uh, and you can see in 2019, we surpassed 1,000 refereed papers with Hubble data per year. Uh, and that that, those papers actually have several different categories I've highlighted here. I want to highlight two of them. The red band, those are guest observer programs from research teams proposing to use the telescope and then publishing papers with those data. The green band are archival researchers who go back to the Hubble archive and publish papers using archival data. And then the bands above that are a mix. You can see over half the publications on Hubble these days come from the archive. Uh, Hubble observing time is awarded by a dual anonymous peer review system we implemented a few years ago. Uh, we were the first facility to do that in astronomy. It's now been replicated at other facilities. And that's where the, not only do the people proposing to use the telescope, are they're anonymous, the reviewers are anonymous, but the reviewers do not know the identities of the proposers, and that's to remove bias in the peer review system. 
The telescope remains in high demand, both by proposals and observing time, the demand outpaces the availability by more than five to one. Uh, can you still hear me okay? Just checking in here at six? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Yes, we can. Uh, so Hubble science evolves with the field. I'm showing two of the more prominent examples of Hubble science. Uh, though this is in the top, the expansion of the universe. Uh, Hubble does a lot of research in this area. At the time Hubble was launched, the expansion rate was a key project for the telescope. It was well known at that point that the universe was expanding, but what was not known was that that expansion was accelerating. And Hubble in tandem with other facilities has played a key role in characterizing both the deceleration and acceleration of the cosmic expansion. And that was the subject of a Nobel prize about a decade ago. And we are currently in an era of precision cosmology with different facilities uh, giving us insight into the expansion of the universe that might be suggesting new physics, which I'll discuss. And the bottom here, I'm showing Hubble's work on exoplanet atmospheres. Uh, the first exoplanet was discovered after Hubble launched. So this was not part of the plan when Hubble launched. But these days, about one fifth of the observing time on Hubble goes to exoplanet science. And Hubble is not a survey telescope for finding exoplanets, but it is the premier facility for following up the discoveries of exoplanets by other facilities. Uh, this is an artist's impression here of the light curve uh, from a real science result with Hubble. Uh, this is a warm Neptune planet and its atmosphere transiting in front of a exoplanet host star. Uh, this is from a result in 2015. Looking in the far ultraviolet, the light curve dips by 56% due to Lyman alpha absorption in the far ultraviolet. If you were looking at this transit in the optical, the light curve would vary by less than 1%. A lot of this science in both cosmology and exoplanets is driven by a new observing mode on the telescope. And that's what I'm demonstrating with the graphics here on the right. It used to be uh, the primary importance was to really hold the telescope as steady as possible during exposure, but now we intentionally move the telescope, dragging the field of view during the exposure at speeds up to eight arc seconds per second. Uh, this is done to enhance the astrometry and the spectroscopy. <clears throat> so in the top panel there, I'm showing you what a star field looks like if you drag the exposure uh, while you're looking at the field. And what this does is this provides you extremely accurate astrometry for those point sources in one axis only. So perpendicular to those trails from the stars, you now have many hundreds of measurements of the astrometry for each of those point sources. Uh, you can also reduce the effects of the telescope's pointing jitter and geometric distortion. And this enables Hubble to measure uh, high precision parallaxes with an accuracy of 20 to 40 micro arc seconds, which is competitive with the parallaxes one gets from Gaia. And this has been used to anchor the cosmic distance ladder measurements that Hubble is participating in. Uh, Hubble looks at Cepheid variable stars, which are a standard candle of a known luminosity. And we measure their distances, their parallaxes with Hubble, and then use those to calibrate distances at greater distances. Uh, so this is anchoring the cosmology work with Hubble. And then on the bottom here, I'm showing you a spectrum being spread out on the detector. So we used to hold uh, the telescope steady. You would get a spectrum in one place on the detector. Uh, but now we spread the, the spectrum out over the detector over the course of the exposure, and this greatly increases the effective full well of the detector. So you can achieve an enormous high signal to noise, collect a very large signal, uh, signal noise of 20 parts per million in each spectral bin, 20 nanometers wide, without saturating the detector because you're spreading your signal out over the whole detector. And this allows us to make exquisite measurements of exoplanet atmospheres because the signal is so faint compared to the host stars. I'll show you some examples of that. Here's the cosmic expansion from supernova calibrated to Cepheid stars. This cartoon on the left shows you the steps how this is done. On the left side of the cartoon, you have the Earth orbiting the sun and measuring parallaxes for nearby Cepheid stars. And that gives us their distances. As I told you, Cepheids are a star that is a standard candle in astronomy. <clears throat> Um, so that tells us we know their intrinsic luminosity, then you measure their luminosity at greater distances, and that tells you how far away they are from their apparent luminosity. So in the left side of the cartoon here, we're calibrating the luminosities of Cepheids, so we can use them at greater distances. That's in the middle of the cartoon. You measure Cepheids in nearby galaxies where you also observe exploding supernovae. And then you can see a supernova explosion at enormous distances across the universe. And so supernova are also a standard candle where we have a calibrated luminosity and then we can measure the apparent luminosity at a great distance and measure the distance to those galaxies. 
So using this technique, various teams have been studying the expansion of the universe and Adam Rees has a result here recently in 2019 measuring the Hubble constant H naught as the 74 kilometers per second per megaparsec as the expansion rate of the universe as measured from local phenomena. This is in contrast to something you'll be hearing about more when you hear the Planck discussion in this series. Uh, the Planck collaboration has been measuring the cosmic microwave background. So this is looking at relics from the early universe and they measure uh, from their cosmological measurements a Hubble constant of 67 and a half kilometers per second, also with a very small uncertainty. And these are discrepant at about four sigma. So if I put these both on the same chart, uh, here are on the left-hand side of this plot in blue are various measurements of the cosmic microwave background and early relics from the early Big Bang. And then in red, I'm showing the measurements looking in the later evolved universe using supernova and cepheids. And you can see the error bars there, they're discrepant at about four sigma, which might be pointing to new physics that's giving us this disconnect between the early universe and the late universe. Looking ahead, we're looking to have an improved calibration for the Cepheid standard candles by combining Hubble and Gaia. Uh, additional supernova observations will take place. We're hoping to reduce these error bars to about 1% and discriminate between some of these physical explanations. There are other ways of coming at the measure of the expansion of the universe uh, that complement the method I showed you there. So this comes from the tip of the red giant branch. It's a stellar evolution path here. So in the upper right is a plot of luminosity for stars versus effective temperature of stars. And the sun is a main sequence star, a dwarf star. So it's sort of towards the bottom right on the graph, burning hydrogen in its core. When that hydrogen is exhausted, it swells up and becomes a red giant branch star. So it goes to the upper right in that diagram. And when it reaches the tip of the red giant branch, the very upper right, there's a helium core flash. You ignite helium, and then you undergo stable core helium burning along that phase called the horizontal branch that I've labeled in blue. That is a standard candle in astronomy as well. And Hubble is doing work in this area. This is a program from Wendy Friedman looking in nearby galaxies with Hubble in the halos of those galaxies. The yellow circles here show the red giant branch stars. That team is measuring this. These plots are luminosity versus color for those red giant branch stars in a series of galaxies. That's a standard candle as well that allows us to measure the distances to those galaxies and come up with a different calibration for the supernova luminosity. And that gives a rate of the Hubble expansion of 70 kilometers per second or so. And if I put that on the same plot against the cosmic microwave background and the Cepheid calibration of supernova, it falls somewhat in between those two measurements. But you can see this is an era of precision cosmology where we're talking about uncertainties at the level of a couple percent. Gravitational lensing is another way we can get at the distance ladder that's independent, does not have any reliance upon supernova. Uh, this is a little bit trickier concept, so I'm going to show it through the cartoon here. Here is Hubble. As we're observing with Hubble, the telescope is looking out into the distant universe at a massive foreground lens galaxy. And then we look further out and we see a background lens quasar behind that lens galaxy. And the light from that quasar, a quasar is an active massive galaxy in the early universe. The light from that quasar can take different paths to the observer because of the foreground lens galaxy. So here I'm highlighting one path, path A, where the light bends around the lens. And then we see a lensed quasar image in the background along that sight line due to that bending. That's path A. Light can also go this way, path B. And if you look backwards, you see the quasar image in this direction. And that travel time is different for those two paths. The, the path through space space is not the same along A or B, and the light travel time typically can vary by about 10 days. And so if one measures the difference on the sky between the positions of the different lensed images, if you measure the time travel delay time by looking at variability in the quasar and comparing that variability with the lensed images, you can actually constrain the cosmology with Hubble images independently from the supernova measurements. So these are lensed images with Hubble, where in the center of each image, you see a massive foreground galaxy, and then the background, a lensed object. And again, this is just using the lens of nature from the gravitational lensing. Using these measurements to constrain the cosmology of space-time, Wang et al. and his team 
measured a Hubble constant of 73 and a half or so kilometers per second, again, with pretty small error bars. And just putting those on a similar plot, these lensing measurements are closer to the supernova measure measurements that were obtained by Reese's team, that were around close to 74 kilometers per second. Uh, and again, much higher than the measurements you get with Planck, so probably pointing to some new physics at work here, given the discrepancy. Hubble does a lot of work on lensing. This is a director's discretionary program, uh, quite a large program from a few, couple of years ago, where the director invested 840 orbits in a community program looking at six massive galaxy clusters. Those are shown in the top six panels here. And then because we have two wide field cameras on Hubble at the same time, they, they can each look at two different patches of sky. There are parallel fields near those clusters shown along the bottom. And then what we do is to efficiently observe these, we swap the cameras back and forth between these two fields. And so these are all lensed objects here. You can see, especially on the right, some very strong lensing arcs from background galaxies lensed by these galaxy clusters. And this lensing, just using nature's lens, uh, really enhances the reach of Hubble. You're able to see galaxies 50 times magnified uh, than compared to how they would be without the lens. And you can detect galaxies about 10 times fainter than we normally could. And so the example here is research from Rachel Livermore's team. I'm looking at two of the galaxy clusters here I've highlighted on the right. And galaxies in the background at different redshifts are shown by different colored circles. So for redshifts of six, seven, eight, and nine in different colors, the key is at the bottom there. And then the red curve is the critical line at redshift of seven from the lens model. And what that critical line tells you is for galaxies at a redshift of seven, if they are at that position where that line falls, they would be infinitely magnified by the lens in theory. So this allows us to peer back in time much further than we could normally. And what Rachel has done here is constructed luminosity functions. So these three plots on the right here are the number of galaxies on the y-axis versus rest frame ultraviolet luminosity of the galaxy on the x-axis with fainter galaxies on the right in each plot. So this is number of galaxies versus luminosity. And you can see the number of galaxies continues to climb as you go to the right side of each of these plots. The number of galaxies, the luminosity function just climbs as you go to fainter luminosities. And there's no turnover discernible in any of these plots at any redshift. At redshifts of six, seven, and eight in the three plots. Uh, so that shows us that the faint galaxies are probably an uh, important source of, of radiation when the, the universe was reionized in the early epochs of the universe. And that's discrepant with some predictions and simulations of the early universe that showed a turnover in the luminosity function at the faint end. These are the lensed images again from the frontier fields. I'm going to zoom in on one of them. This is a supernova event that was det detected in one of these fields. It would have been detected in 1995 if we had been looking, but the host galaxy for this supernova appears at multiple places in this image, again, because of the lensing. And so it was observed during the Frontier Fields program at 2014. And then the folks modeling this field and doing the lensing modeling predicted it would that same exact supernova event would be observable again in either late 2015 or sometime in 2016. They made that prediction and published it. And while monitoring the field, astronomers did see the supernova explode again. So you can watch the same explosive event in nature out in the distant universe happened multiple times because of the lensing and the delay in the different light travel paths to the observer. And again, as I mentioned earlier, this can be used to constrain cosmology. Uh, in this setup here, the first attempt to constrain the cosmology that was published in 2018, this work is still ongoing, but the initial preliminary results show a Hubble constant of 64 kilometers per second, plus or minus 10 kilometers per second, which is consistent with some of the earlier measurements I discussed. I'm gonna shift gears here now to the more nearby universe. Uh, so this is exoplanet science I'll be talking about for the next few slides. Exoplanet science really began in the 1980s. Uh, what I'm showing here is a ground-based image of Beta Pictoris. Uh, this is not a system where direct planets were observed at the time, but this was actually a protoplanetary disk that you can see there, a dust disk that shows up in the image. Hubble was launched in 1990 at the time. There were no known exoplanets, so the observing program that year did not have any exoplanet science. The first 
exoplanet around a normal star like our own sun was discovered through radial velocity measurements in the mid 90s. And that's a plot there of radial velocity versus orbital phase. The oldest known exoplanet at the moment, uh, Hubble played a role in that, and that has quite a long story to it. This is a globular cluster, uh, as imaged by Hubble, uh, called M4. It's the nearest globular cluster. It's a population of stars. It's a cluster of stars of around 100,000 stars that are about 13 billion years old. And in the late 80s, a binary pulsar was discovered in the core of this cluster. And then in the early 90s, people studying the pulsar noticed timing anomalies that might have implied the presence of a Jupiter mass planet around the pulsar. In the late 90s, radio observations pointed that, to the possibility that it was increasingly likely that there's a Jupiter mass planet in the system. And then in 2003, researchers looking at archival Hubble data over a series of years confirmed that there was a planet of two and a half Jupiter masses in a triple system there with the pulsar. And this is, at the moment is the oldest known planet at 13 billion years old. This is a plot from Sarah Seeger just demonstrating how difficult exoplanet science is. This is a plot of luminosity versus wavelength uh, for a sun-like star at the top. That's a logarithmic scale of brightness on the y-axis. And you can see different planet brightnesses for a hot Jupiter or planets in our solar system, orders of magnitude below that. This makes it very difficult to find exoplanets because they're so much fainter than their hosts. And for that reason, the number of exoplanets was uh, pretty small until very recently. In 1990, we knew of no exoplanets. And then through a variety of method, methods shown here by different color coding, we now know of thousands of them, mostly through dedicated surveys like the TESS and Kepler missions. Hubble is not a survey telescope, but it is used to follow up exoplanet discoveries. It's excellent at exoplanet atmosphere characterization. Uh, the first detection of an exoplanet atmosphere occurred in 2002. This is the STIS spectrum, the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph spectrum in the optical of a transiting exoplanet around a sun-like star. The spectral type is G05, similar to the sun. The planet in question is uh, Jupiter in size. And the observers here obtained spectrophotometry over four transits and looked at the variation in sodium absorption, which I'm showing here on the right. The top panel plot shows the spectral absorption features. And then the bottom panel shows the variation. And there was a four sigma variation at the sodium absorption showing an atmosphere containing sodium. The first detection of an organic molecule in an atmosphere of an exoplanet uh, occurred somewhat later. This is with the now dormant NICMOS instrument looking in the near infrared and looking as a planet transits in front of the star and seeing variation due to methane absorption. So on the lower right is the spectrum. The black points are the data from Hubble, NICMOS. And then there are two different curves shown for model atmospheres. In blue is an atmosphere with water in the atmosphere, but no methane, does not agree with the data particularly well. And then in orange is a model agreeing with the black points very well that includes methane. So this is the first detection of methane in an exoplanet atmosphere. And this is a hot Jupiter star observing, uh, transiting a cooler K dwarf star. This is the first time that Hubble has, was used to observe the atmospheres of Earth-sized exoplanets. And this was done for two exoplanets in the, trans, tra, the TRAPPIST system that were transiting their star. This was uh, an example of that spatial scanning technique I mentioned earlier, where we intentionally moved the spectrum over the detector during the observation to increase the signal noise and allow us to detect much fainter signals, uh, much higher signal to noise ratio. And so this was spatial scanning in the infrared TRAPPIST-1b and TRAPPIST-1c are the two exoplanets here simultaneously transiting the star. And the spectra are shown below compared to various models that include helium and hydrogen. And these models imply that these exoplanet atmospheres lack envelopes of hydrogen and helium and increase the probability that these planets are habitable. This was published in Nature in 2016. Hubble, a couple of years ago, made the first detection of helium in an exoplanet atmosphere. This is, again, spatial scanning with Wide Field Camera 3 in the infrared. This is a warm gas giant orbiting an active star, a cool K dwarf star, for one transit. The transit light curve is shown on the right. And then the signal here, the four and a half sigma detection of helium in the infrared is also shown in the plots on the lower left. Uh, and this was published in Nature in 2018. That's the first helium detection in an atmosphere of an exoplanet. 
And finally here for this exoplanet slide here, I'm showing the most detailed look at an exoplanet atmosphere yet. This is from work that Hannah Wakeford has done, is combining data from several different facilities, the STIS instrument on Hubble and the ultraviolet and optical, uh, optical data from the VLT on the ground, infrared data from Hubble with C3, and then infrared data from Spitzer IRAC. Spitzer is another great observatory in space. And the composite spectrum is shown in the graphic in the upper right. On the bottom, I'm showing the constraints one gets physically for the exoplanet when only looking at the infrared data. So those are shown in purple. So let me start with the plot on the lower right shows the spectra over the wavelength range here are the black points. And I'm only including the data points in black that are in the infrared. The purple banding shows the variety of exoplanet atmosphere models that are consistent with those black points when you're only looking with the infrared data. And the models, the properties, the physical properties of those models are shown in the panels on the left. Those six little boxes show the distribution of models that agree with the data for temperature, metallicity, carbon to oxygen ratio, planet radius, the haze in the atmospheres, and the cloud in the atmospheres. There's a wide range of models that agree with the data. Once we add in multi-wavelength data, the constraints get much tighter. So now the spectrum on the lower right the banding from the models is now shown in green. It has a much tighter distribution. The black points go from the ultraviolet into the infrared, constraining the model much more securely. And the distribution of, of physical parameters on the left now has tightened up as well. I have a much better understanding of the temperatures, metallicities, et cetera, in the atmosphere. So combining ultraviolet, optical, and infrared data gives exquisite constraints on the exoplanet atmosphere. And this is work done right now with the facilities we have in hand. We're really looking forward to Hubble and Webb when Webb launches next year, working in tandem to get these kind of exoplanet atmosphere constraints on additional exoplanets. Uh, Hubble doesn't just work on distant solar systems, as you've been hearing about in this talk series. Uh, you know, there are many missions inside our own solar system. Alan Stern gave a talk in this series uh, looking at the New Horizons mission to Pluto. Hubble played a role in that mission by helping the navigation and make sure that New Horizons was able to safely navigate and avoid debris along the path. Uh, while doing so, Hubble identified four new moons of Pluto and provided navigation assistance also to a follow-up target, which is shown here on the right, for the extended mission of New Horizons. So the Hubble image is shown in the center of the slide and then the right-hand side of the slide here is the New Horizons image at closest approach. These are beautiful images of Juno obtained with Hubble at different wavelengths earlier this year. This is a 2020 press release from Hubble. You also have heard in this series uh, about the Juno mission. Uh, so those, that's a Jupiter uh, image here. And then this is synergy between Hubble and the Juno mission. Uh, the Juno mission, as you've heard previously in this talk series, Juno is in orbit around Jupiter. Uh, it has a close passage every 53 days, and there is a coordinated program with Hubble uh, and the Juno team. So every 53 days when Juno passes close to the planet and obtains its measurements, Hubble is pointed at Jupiter as well, getting synergistic information in a wide range of filters spanning the ultraviolet, optical, and near-infrared. The filters are listed here for all the different wavelengths. And this multi-wavelength observations work in tandem with the microwave measurements from Juno. I'm showing in the lower left here a series of Hubble images of storms on Jupiter, also a Gemini thermal infrared image. And then on the right, I'm showing how the synergy between these different facilities really informs what's going on with Jupiter's storms. So in the upper right, it's a combination of Hubble wide field camera three data with the Juno microwave radiometer. Uh, Hubble appears deep into the water clouds. Uh, Jupiter show the Juno mission is able to show the strong ammonia depletion in the region between the storms. You can even see lightning flashes, which are indicated by the little cyan circles there. In the lower right uh, is information that's gleaned from ground-based observatories working with Juno, uh, the Gemini near-infrared imager, the Keck near-infrared spectrometer, and Juno in the microwaves. Uh, the Gemini image shows regions of low cloud opacity between the storms, and then Keck provides independent constraints on the ammonia. And so again, all these facilities work in tandem to give us insight into a giant planet in our own solar system. 
Hubble looks at stars in the nearby universe, and this is the kind of research I tend to do myself as well. Uh, I won't be talking about my research results here, but talking about some other folks who are doing work in this area. Uh, what I'm showing here is a crowded star field observed with Hubble. The blue stars are hot and the red stars are cool. And you see different temperatures and luminosities in this image. And what I'm going to do here is sort the image in color and luminosity. Uh, so let me start the animation here. We're gonna zoom in and then sort the colors from right to left with hot blue stars on the left, cooler red stars on the right. And that's what's happening here. And then we're going to sort in luminosity with brighter stars at the top and fainter stars at the bottom. And you see when you do this, the distribution of color and luminosity is not random. You don't have every possible color and luminosity, but instead it traces out this very distinctive pattern. This is the life cycle of a low mass star like the sun. The sun is a dwarf star, which would be towards the bottom of this diagram. And as I mentioned earlier in the talk, uh, dwarf stars eventually swell out and become red giants. That would be the upper right in this picture. Then they undergo a helium core flash, start helium core burning, and move over to the upper left here where they become hot blue stars and eventually fade as white dwarfs down along the left-hand side of the diagram there. So when Hubble takes a picture of a group of stars and measures the colors and luminosities, this pattern of stellar evolution informs the star formation history measurements for that galaxy. And Hubble can do this type of diagram, make this kind of uh, measurement out to about one megaparsec in the local universe. So that includes the entire local group of galaxies. And so Hubble can measure the star formation history through different sight lines throughout the local group. I'll show you some more examples of that here. Aline Tolstoy published these reviews below. This is a color magnitude diagram, uh, brightness on the y-axis versus color in the central plot here for different stars at different masses, uh, ranging from very massive O stars that are over 100 times the mass of the sun they have a lifetime that's only about 3 million years in this diagram. You, know, you go down to G stars like the sun, uh, one solar mass, uh, they live for billions of years. And then M dwarf stars at half a solar mass live for many billions of years. They all evolve at different rate, uh, paces through this diagram, different rates. And so if you make this kind of measurement, the distribution of stars in this kind of diagram, you can reconstruct the star formation history. And so Hubble does a lot of this every cycle, every observing cycle. Uh, going back for years. This is a program from Evan Skillman looking at dwarf galaxies orbiting the Andromeda galaxy in, our, in, in the local group. Andromeda is the other large spiral besides the Milky Way in the nearby universe. And here are six dwarf galaxies where we again have measured carb. Uh, this is Evan Skillman's group measuring luminosity versus color here. And you can see that distribution as I showed earlier. And if you characterize that with models, you get the star formation history shown on the lower right. This is a plot of the mass fraction formed on the y-axis versus the time, cosmic time, on the x-axis with the present day zero on the right-hand side and the ancient universe the back in the Big Bang on the left-hand side. The era of reionization is shown by the gray vertical band there. And so you have uh, that's the start of the clock on the left-hand side. No stars are formed, so the cumulative star mass fraction is zero, and then it climbs up to one along different paths there for the different galaxies, depending upon their star formation history. So you can reconstruct the formation of stars in each of these sight lines. This is another program that's underway looking at star formation. And this is in a similar vein to the Frontier Fields lensing program I showed earlier in the sense that it's a director's discretionary program, very large program, a thousand orbits over the next three years. Uh, the name of the program is called the Ulysses Program, the Ultraviolet Legacy Library of Young Stars and Essential Standards. Uh, this is going to create a spectroscopic ultraviolet library of young, low mass and high mass stars. Uh, this program was designed working with a community working group of such experts. It's going to sample the fundamental parameter space in each of these mass regimes. There's an implementation team at Space Telescope Science Institute led by Julia Roman Duval. And she's working in tandem in the community with a scientific advisory committee. Here is the evolutionary diagram for young stars. Again, luminosity on the y-axis versus temperature on the x-axis. Uh, you can see here how stars of different masses evolve through this diagram, ranging from half a solar mass up to 15 solar masses there. So we're spending about 500 orbits making a library of O and B stars, massive stars at low metallicity in this part of the diagram. And then 500 orbits 
looking at younger stars at very low masses, below one mass or below the mass of the sun and ages less than 10 million years old. And the spectra you get look like this. On the left-hand side, I'm showing for high mass stars, the kind of physics you can do with the spectrum shown on the lower left. Uh, you can do stellar astrophysics of winds in massive stars, their chemistry, the ionizing radiation. You can make population templates for studying these stars at greater distances. Uh, these stars also illuminate the dark medium between us and these stars. Uh, so you can look at the interstellar medium, uh, the chemistry, the dust. You can look at the circumgalactic medium between us along, and these stars along this sight line. That's another large area of study for Hubble, the circumgalactic medium. You look at the kinematics, the spatial distribution, its chemistry. For low mass stars, we can study accretion physics, shocks, flows, disks, and jets. And we're doing some time monitoring of these objects. As I mentioned, the circumgalactic medium is a key area of study for Hubble. It was the primary motivation for the cosmic origin spectrograph, one of the four instruments I mentioned earlier. Uh, so what the cosmic origin spectrograph does is it'll look at a distant background source like a quasar, an active galaxy, and then investigate the dark material along that sight line. So it uses the background galaxy as a flashlight to illuminate the material between us and the quasar. And doing that, you get these spectra I'm showing here in the middle of the slide. This informs the, us of the chemistry, the ionization states, the kinematics, and the distribution of that material along our sight lines. And there's a significant investment of observing time going into UV spectroscopy along various sight lines to probe the chemistry of the circumgalactic medium in the nearby universe and the distant universe. The lower left here shows a large program that's executing. Uh, just published uh, pre this press release this past year, uh, looking at dozens of sight lines probing the hot halo of gas around the Andromeda galaxy in the nearby universe. So all these little orange circles here are background quasars that are giving us sight lines through that hot halo of gas. And they've revealed a surprisingly complex and layered structure in the enormous halo of gas around the Andromeda galaxy. The Andromeda galaxy is a tiny little disk galaxy you can see at the center of that cloud if you look closely. Looking in the more distant universe, Hubble can look at a distant high redshift quasar or intermediate redshift quasar and look at the clouds of gas along that sight line. So that's what's being shown here by these various spectra. These show the absorbing systems in the gas along the circumgalactic medium out into a redshift of one. Uh, this team found new Lyman limit systems at intermediate redshift. These are regions where the gas density is high enough to shield itself against ionizing radiation from external sources. And they also show a complex chemistry and ionization. Those quasars are black holes and Hubble does a lot of work on black holes. Uh, going back to M84, the, the, this work in M84 of a discovery of a black hole with STIS. STIS is known in the popular news frequently as a black hole hunter. Uh, so M84 is an elliptical galaxy. I'm showing a high resolution image with Hubble here from Wide Field Planetary Camera 2 in the center. And then there's a little slit that's placed there along the black hole location. And it gives us this spatially resolved spectrum on the right there with STIS, where you can see the dramatic jump to the blue and then to the red in the spectrum. That's from the blue shifting and red shifting on either side of the black hole, implying a velocity of around 400 kilometers per second at a 0.26 light years out from the black hole and giving us a black hole mass of around 300 million solar masses. So that's combining the high resolution imaging with the spatially resolved spectroscopy along the slit. Just as an aside here, I'll note that the Nobel Prize in Physics this past year went to three researchers studying black holes, not with Hubble. This is a, these are distinct results, uh, both in theory of black holes and using ground-based observatories to look at the center of the Milky Way, just to mention uh, congratulations to the group studying black holes. Uh, Hubble does an enormous amount of work doing black hole surveys over the last 20 years, ever since that M84 result. Uh, and once we have enough, we can do statistics that demonstrate conclusively that supermassive black holes are ubiquitous in the centers of galaxies, and they clearly play a role in the evolution of those galaxies. And that's shown in these three plots here. Uh, this is black hole mass on the y-axis in each panel. 
On, on the left, it's black hole mass versus galaxy mass, showing a tight correlation. In the center, it's black hole mass versus the bulge luminosity in the galaxy, showing uh, some relation, but it's a little more scatter. And then on the right, the black hole mass in, so on a log scale versus central velocity dispersion, showing a fairly tight correlation. So there's a clear link between the presence of a supermassive black hole and the evolution of its host galaxy. Uh, besides surveys of black holes, Hubble probes individual supermassive black holes. Uh, for example, this recent result looking in the spiral galaxy NGC 3147. There's a 250 million solar mass black hole there with an accretion disk around it that appears to encroach closer to the black hole than predicted from theory. That's what's shown here in the plot on the lower right, comparing the accretion disk to different models of the Kaplerian disk. And Hubble is now more recently starting to investigate gravitational wave events. And this is what uh, researchers call multi-messenger astronomy, because now we're, prob we're doing probes of the universe beyond what you can do with electromagnetic radiation. Uh, so gravitational wave experiments are now coming online around the world. And uh, one that got a lot of press in 2017 was this event I'm showing you here. That was a gravitational wave event detected by two different experiments, uh, the advanced LIGO and Virgo experiments. The associated gamma ray burst was detected by two facilities and then localized to a galaxy about 40 megaparsecs away. Hubble and other facilities were brought online to follow up and obtain the data I'm showing here on the left. So this, these are images obtained with Hubble of the gravitational wave event as it fades over the course uh, from August 22nd to August 28th in 2017. Uh, we expect Hubble to play a critical role in this kind of work throughout the 2020s because there are more gravitational wave experiments coming online. There are all sky surveys at a variety of wavelengths that are going to be tracking and discovering new transient phenomena. And as I mentioned at the start of this talk, Hubble is unique in the ultraviolet and optical capabilities it brings to this kind of work. It'll help us localize the host within the, the event, the transient event within a host galaxy, provide high precision astrometry and photometry, and discriminate between different models of the event. And just to show an example of that, for this event here, here is the brightness with brightness, uh, brighter objects at the top versus time along the x-axis here uh, for different wavelengths, which is color-coded here from the ultraviolet out into the infrared. These are different light curves of that same gravitational, after, uh, gravitational wave aftermath uh, showing the decay of that gravitational wave event as a function of time at different wavelengths. And you can see in the ultraviolet, the purple curves fall very steeply compared to the infrared, infrared curves, which have a more gradual decay. So the ultraviolet falls off the quickest. It also gives the strongest discrimination between different models of the event. So this is something we expect to be doing more of throughout the 2020s. And so just to summarize, this is the 30th anniversary image of Hubble. I'm showing you here on the left, uh, appropriately, the, one of the objects in this image is NGC 2020. This was obtained this past year. Uh, so we expect Hubble will continue to play an exciting role in the next decade of astrophysics, uh, because Hubble and Webb working together will give us great new insights into exoplanet atmospheres. We'll get increasingly tight constraints on dark energy and the expansion of the universe with a variety of techniques. We're going to have continuing cooperation between Hubble and solar system exploration missions. And then Hubble's unique capabilities will play an important role in synergy with the facilities that are doing all sky and multi-messenger surveys of transient phenomena in the universe. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed. You have to multiply my applause by more than a factor of 200. <laughs> So this was really a wonderful tour through all the aspects that, that Hubble covers from very nearby to the yeah, very distant objects in the universe. Now, to give the participants a chance to participate, there are two channels. You can either raise your hand in the participant list, and then we try to call upon you, or you can write your question or comment in the chat, and then I can and will read it loud. So there is one first message in the chat, but this is just Bernard Foing thanking you for a great HSD highlights overview. There's one hand raised by Krasina Stasinska, but she had raised this hand very early on. Is Are you still on? Do you want to speak up? Saliba, can you unmute her? Could you please unmute your microphone? 
maybe she's not on anymore. The next raised hand is by Roger Bonnet. So please, Roger, you can speak, you're unmuted. Roger, now you yeah. <laughs> can hear. We can hear you now, yes. Okay, thank you very much. So this is uh, so many things <laughs> in such a short term that it is very difficult to analyze what is the most important. For me, one of the most important is the last one that you mentioned, which is the detection of gravitational waves. And this century, which we are just uh, starting, is, is, we'll see a new revolution in astronomy, which is uh, the astronomy of gravitational waves. Um, if you want to contribute more to the detection of gravitational waves, what would you change on the instrumentation of Hubble uh, to really make a, a dramatic uh, cooperation to the, to the search of the gravitational wave characteristics and, and uh, numbers and uh, essentially what is the need for Hubble to uh, do bet much better than it does today? Uh, or what kind of instrument uh, will, will continue this extraordinary work that you have shown? So the, thanks, the, thanks for your question. The, the contribution that Hubble makes in this is the rapid follow-up in the ultraviolet. So high precision spect spectra and photometry in the ultraviolet. And so the instruments that are on board Hubble right now <clears throat> are useful for that. But the limiting factor really that uh, impinges the science a little bit is that Hubble can only respond on a time scale really of 36 to 48 hours is the quickest Hubble can turn around. And so as you saw how quickly those light curves fall off, uh, so observers are asking us to respond more and more rapidly to these events. So we're constantly looking to make that process more efficient. It's not like there's someone sitting on the ground with a joystick pointing the telescope. There's a lot of mechanics involved in the link to, to get us pointed on the target. So really to the fastest, every step in that chain that we can can, everything we can do to make that chain more rapid, you know, from detection to localization to follow up with Hubble, uh, really improves the constraints on those events. And so that's really where, where I think gains can be made in the near future is to try to respond as rapidly as possible. But right now there is, there is a pretty hard limit with the hardware that we have on the observatory to respond to that on the inside of about 36 to 48 hours. Thank you, thank you very much. Do you want me to respond to any of these questions in the chat here or? Uh, well, I, I'm reading them to you. So okay. Ari, La, Ari Laor is asking, what is expected to limit the lifespan of HST? Uh, so the different subsystems on Hubble each have a different uh, prediction uh, for, for what their life expectancy is. Uh, all of the subsystems have over 80% reliability through 2026. Uh, the instruments have more than 90% reliability through that time scale. Really, the part of the observatory that gets the most attention in the press and with the scientific community is the pointing control system, the gyroscopes. So uh, during the last servicing mission, we put in six gyroscopes, uh, three of a type that we have been using previously, and then three of a new type that have an enhancement to make them last longer. They should last about five times longer. Uh, and indeed, up till now, we have now lost three of the six gyroscopes, all of the old style. They all lasted about what you'd expect. And the new gyroscopes that were doing pretty well, and in fact, one of them is now the record holder for the amount of time that one of these has functioned in space. It's twice as long as the mean lifetime so far. We're hoping that we still get many years out of it. But that's really what we keep an eye on are the gyroscopes, is if I had to guess you know, what's, what's the most worrisome component of the observatory. But we have hopes that we can continue doing science on three gyroscopes uh, through at least the next few years, and then we can continue doing science on one or two gyroscopes throughout the decade. Very closely related question by Bernard Foing. What is the future planned for HST? Uh, so the future is right now uh, to keep evolving with the field. You know, we, it's hard to predict what the time allocation committee will award each year. Uh, like I said, up until not that long ago, we didn't do anything with exoplanets. And now for the past five years or so, 20% of the time goes into exoplanet science. I expect there will be more and more science geared towards transient phenomena, not just gravitational waves but other variable events as uh, telescopes like the Rubin Observatory on the ground, uh, the Roman Observatory in space do these all-sky surveys looking at transit phenomena. So I imagine that's gonna be more of the focus is really following up with Hubble on explosive transient astronomy uh, and, and more weight going to that as opposed to some of the other topics that it covers. 
Thank you. Now there's a raised hand by Hans Zinniger. Saliba, can you, sorry, the diff, this different one. Hans Zinniger, can you unmute him? Hans, can, you can speak up. Not yet. Hans, can you unmute your microphone, please? Now? Yes, we can hear you. Can yes, yes, oh, we can. But following up on the exoplanet questions, but also some other aspects. Well, Hubble is a two and a half meter telescope, but there are 10 meter telescopes on the ground, which can do also many things in exoplanet science. So I was wondering if you could comment on the differential advantage of Hubble over those larger ground based telescopes, apart from the ultraviolet which is obvious, but is it the stability of the point spread function or, or, or is it the new uh, techniques, observing techniques, the scanning techniques that you mentioned, which was very interesting. And um, yeah, some examples where Hubble wins over VLT or Keck, say. Right, well, most of those exoplanet results I showed you were, I mean, although some of them were in the ultraviolet, most were in the near infrared. Uh, the, so there's really multiple things going on here. It's Hubble provides a, a multi-wavelength insight into the exoplanets, and some of those wavelengths are only accessible from space, as I mentioned, and as you just pointed out. But also it's the, the precision and stability of the spectrophotometry. That's very key here because, as, as I mentioned earlier, the exoplanet signal is extremely faint compared to its host star. And what one does is a differential spectrum when the, the planet is in front of its star and behind the star, you take the difference in those two spectra and it's a very faint signal. So you need a very stable sig signal over that entire transit for both you know, inside and outside of transit. And that's where Hubble is still in very high demand for doing this kind of work because the space platform that we have is extremely stable compared to on the ground. It's true that the ground is making great strides in this area, a long word of one micron with adaptive optics, uh, you can get fairly high resolution, but the, in terms of stability, it's still a bit of a challenge. And then also there are absorption bands in near infrared on the ground that are unavoidable uh, that are, Frequently, some of the same absorption bands you would want to know uh, for the exoplanet atmosphere, you know, bands of water absorption, et cetera. And you'd really like to not have those absorption features happening from our own atmosphere. You really want to be focusing on those features in the exoplanet atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Thank you. From the chat again, Ludwig Klein is asking, thank you for the talk concerning supernovae as distance indicators. How sure can we be that supernova light curves from events in the distant past can be considered as equivalent to supernova light curves in the relatively close universe that we can calibrate with Cepheids? So a lot of work is put into that to, to try to calibrate out any possible evolution in the intrinsic luminosity of the supernova. And so most of the expansion work is done at redshifts uh, I'd say between zero and one redshift to, uh, to one and a half or so. But these teams are also looking in the more distant universe just to try to get as much of a handle on the age axis as possible and getting spectra of these supernova. So it's not just, you're not just getting photometry of the brightness and assuming you understand the object, you get a spectrum of the object, which gives you insight into the physics of the supernova. And then you can see, all right, is there an evolution in the spectral energy distribution that's telling us there's an evolution that then means that this, this standard candle needs a different calibration. And so a lot of work goes into that. That is a major concern of the folks using these as standard candles. And to date, uh, they're able to account for such evolutionary effects. And the, the Hubble diagram showing the Hubble flow as a function of distance has a you know, very tiny, some small amount of scatter implying that they seem to be, to be handling that correctly. <laughs> Thanks. Two questions addressing possible future Hubble Space Telescope maintaining missions from uh, astronauts at the ISS. Are there any plans? Is this possible still? To service Hubble? Is that what the question? Yes, 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 maintaining, uh, servicing. So, well, you know, the space shuttle program for the United States ended uh, you know, a while back, and that's when the Hubble servicing stopped. There are no official plans at the moment to service Hubble again, but we do see other, you know, uh, programs coming online. There's been a lot of news recently about SpaceX. Uh, so it's always conceivable that, you know, as, as humans are returning to space by different companies coming online and it's becoming this partnership between governments and industry, 
uh, you know, it, it's conceivable that someone could decide to help service Hubble again, but at the moment there are no plans to do so. But, you know, obviously that would be exciting. Thanks. So these questions were from Bernard Foying and uh, Tusha Abad. Now a question from Henny Lamas. What are the programs that will be done in collaboration between JWST and HST? So curiously enough, the first observing cycle for JWST, there's an annual call with James Webb as well. And the deadline is next Tuesday at eight o'clock, I believe. So people are right now furiously while I'm talking to you working on their observing proposals. And some of those will be done, I'm sure we'll request time uh, with Hubble in tandem. There are There is a joint coordinated program. So uh, observers can request time on both time of the telescope simultaneously, thus avoiding double jeopardy, having to go through two reviews. Uh, so we'll have to see what happens. I imagine there'll be quite a lot of requests uh, for doing exoplanet science, but other science as well. Uh, so we'll have to see, but the deadline is uh, this coming next week and then uh, next year they'll make awards. So uh, we'll have to see where that comes out. Thank you. Um, question from Ari Laor again. What is the forecast for a future UV telescope which will replace HST? Uh, so right now the decadal survey of astrophysics is underway, uh, as people might know. So every decade the field comes together and tries to decide what missions will happen. There are four flagship mission concepts under heavy discussion right now. And at least one of those has a significant uh, focus in the UV that's similar to Hubble. That's the Louvoir mission that's being discussed right now. It's unclear when any of these missions will launch or any of them will be pursued. Uh, like I said, right now, the, the field is discussing the merits of these different facilities. Uh, but the Louvoir mission in principle, you know, if it got approved and was pursued uh, as an international project, one can imagine it perhaps launching in the late 2030s or 2040. Uh, so, you know, obviously we would want Hubble to last as long as possible to not have much of a gap in UV astronomy. Thank you. Now, I have a question. At the beginning, you mentioned that by now the refereeing process for the Hubble is doubly blind. Mm -hmm. And I think you mentioned it removed biases. Can you comment on this a little bit? What type of biases were removed this way? Sure. I mean, so it's going to take the statistical signal here is small. So it's going to take several observing cycles to really delve into this deeply. But if you look before we implemented the dual anonymous system, there was a tendency, if you looked at the statistics over many cycles, to favor male PIs over female PIs. Uh, in any one cycle, it tended to be sort of within the statistical uncertainties. But if it happens the same way every cycle, you see the systematic trend. Uh, there's also a tendency to award time to well-established teams instead of new researchers. And you know that's not necessarily healthy for the field either. I mean, it's great that there are established teams that have expertise that can use the telescope. I don't want to disparage that. But at the same time, you do want to encourage new people in the field or new ideas coming into the field fresh out of school. Uh, and you want to level the playing field a little bit there as well. So that was the motivation for this. And as far as we can tell so far, it does seem to be leveling the playing field a bit. But again, the statistical uncertainty in, in any given observing cycle is pretty large on because these are small populations in each cycle. So we'll see going forward. But that is the motivation. And uh, there was a lot of discussion in the community when we implemented this a few years ago, some resistance, some people in favor. But now it seems to be adopted widely now. We're seeing it come on as a trend. Things. I must say, I was personally very impressed by the many gravitational lens examples that you showed because they are, this is in fact my field as well. But I want to mention at this place that a pioneer in gravitational lensing was Fritz Zwicky, a Swiss scientist who worked at Caltech later on, and he predicted the lensing of clusters and that we can do cosmology and confirm the dark matter and everything. Now, there's one more raised hand, Bernard Foying. You also ask questions in the chat. Is everything uh, asked already, or would you still like to ask a question? Oh, yeah, OK. It was a follow-up of the question uh, concerning the future mission. So yes, with the advent of a lower cost uh, commercial uh, human space flight mission, did you have a, a, like a design study of what would be possible with a, a Dragon type of a vehicle? and? Also, from the scientific point of view, is there some new generation of instrument that would really be competitive in the area of uh, uh, JWST and other facilities where uh, still the, the good old HST would, would be a, a great workhorse? Sure. I mean, there are no actual official studies underway to try to use Dragon, so that would have to be scoped out. But it's, you know, the Hubble is still very powerful, but the last instruments went in in 2009. And 
you know, instrumentation has made enormous strides over the past decade. So it's not too hard to imagine instruments one would put in there if that happened. I mean, for example, instead of, you know, Hubble, the wide field cameras on Hubble have a field of view limited by, you know, how many pixels you can put in the focal plane back in 2009. Uh, so, you know, these are these cameras have a field of view of just a few arc minutes, whereas other facilities coming online, like the Roman Space Telescope or the Rubin Telescope on the ground, these have enormous fields of view that are going to survey the sky at longer wavelengths than Hubble. So you can imagine putting in a blue wavelength, you know, an ultraviolet to blue uh, light uh, wide field camera where wide field is what we would call wide field these days instead of wide field of 10 years ago you know, uh, a much wider field of view tile the focal plane with pixels, just as an example. I mean, so their instrumentation has really grown tremendously in the past decade. So yeah, there are some obvious things one could do. I mean, spectrographs as well, ultraviolet spectrographs have improved since then, detector technology. The spectrographs I showed there, um, you know, were STIS and COS. STIS, STIS is late 90s technology. COS was installed in 2009. It has a high sensitivity for faint point sources, mainly because it has so few reflections because you lose a lot of light in the reflections on these ultraviolet spectrographs and STIS has more reflections internally on a light path than COS does. You can imagine a few bounce system with detectors that had much higher throughput because ultraviolet detectors, the throughput is much higher today than it was 10 years ago. So the spectrographs would be much more powerful too. So yeah, I mean, it's it's not too hard to think of instruments one would maybe want to put in there, but there's nothing underway at the moment. Yeah, so promising when we can afford. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you. One more question in the chat from Hans Tinniger again. Can you give an example where archival data made a huge game-changing impact? Uh, sure. Well, the, the, I would refer to that plot I showed earlier, where early in the days of Hubble, most of the papers coming out of Hubble were from observers saying, I would like you know, 20 orbits of time on Hubble to do this project, and then they go publish in the next couple of years that result. But the Hubble archive spans so many areas of science and so many objects. We have an archive program every year where people are allowed to submit ideas for archival requests to do archival science, and they can do archival science on vast swaths of data in the Hubble archive. In fact, in the last couple cycles, we now have a new cloud computing category of archival science where people can use the commercial cloud on Amazon Web Services to do analysis you know, with the, the commercial compute resources right alongside the data. All of the Hubble data that are public are not just on our Institute archives, but they're in the commercial cloud. And so people can submit archival proposals now to do archival research using cloud computing. And you can do an analysis on you know, every Hubble image with wide field camera three in just a few minutes for very cheap and submit an archival proposal to do that. So you see this explosive growth in archival research in that plot I showed earlier of the publications versus time. And now over half of the papers coming out of Hubble use the archive in at least some way. And you can do these enormous studies that you know look across many different targets through a variety of programs over the history of the, of the mission. Thanks. There had been a raised hand by Roger Bonnet again, but it's gone now. Roger, are you still there? Still interested in asking? If not, let me mention what I was very impressed by is the synergy between the Hubble and the planetary missions. I mean, you mentioned Juno and New Horizon, and you even referred to the talks here in the Game Changer series. Wonderful that Hubble works as the sort of guide for the satellite mission to go through without uh, you know, running into little stones or so. Really great. That was a really, I have to also, I just have to say thanks to the folks, both in the flight controls uh, team and in the science operations team, when the, gui the guiding was done for New Horizons. Just as a technical aside here, the observations had to be very close to the solar avoidance uh, for the sun. We, we're not allowed to point the telescope within 50 degrees of the sun. And to do the New Horizons navigation and help them out, we had to point right at that limit. And so the teams really had to work diligently to not ensure just the safety of New Horizons, but also Hubble. So it was really a great partnership seeing the two teams work together. I just think. Okay, so Roger Bonnet is raising his hand again. Roger. Yeah, so sorry for not uh, having the signal uh, to, to talk to you on my computer. Um, I just thank you again for this uh, absolutely fascinating uh, example of what uh, we can do from space. <laughs> thank you very much. 
I've been Thank working you. with HST before he was born, maybe before you were born also, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I am very impressed by this achievement. One of the most impressive uh, observations made by uh, HST for me was the, uh, the thanks to, uh, to Bob Wilson, uh, the deep space observations, uh, using long uh, time exposures. Uh, I have just a curious, uh, I'm curious to know how long have been the longest time exposures made to look at the deep universe. And how many days, how many months, I don't know. Sure, yeah, so the deepest programs uh, you know, Hubble tends to, the currency in Hubble is orbits. We award time in orbits and large programs are generally somewhere in the hundreds of orbits, you know. And so the Hubble ultra deep field had a very deep stare of hundreds of orbits and in different filters. Uh, I did a large program looking at Andromeda myself before I was in the job I'm in now. Uh, did the Andromeda deep field peering through Andromeda for 121 orbits. That's still the deepest optical image ever obtained in space. Uh, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field is deeper because it covers way more wavelengths. Uh, some of these frontier fields images I said before uh, have spent 840 orbits looking through different sight lines and then amplifying the effect of those orbital investments by using gravitational lensing to see even further. Uh, so there have been a, a bunch of deep programs. Kailash Sahu looked at the center of the Milky Way looking for exoplanets through transits with Hubble. And that he spent uh, you know, a good fraction of his time for a whole week uh, of Hubble observations, monitoring hundreds of thousands of stars in the galactic center and watching for when the light changed from, star from planets passing in front of the stars. And that was in the sweeps program. Uh, so there have been an, a bunch of programs looking not just in the deep high reach of the universe, but in nearby objects as well and everything in between. Yeah. Thank you, wonderful. Okay, one more raised hand by Hans Sinega. Saliba, can you unmute Hans? Hans, you're, can you unmute yourself? Uh, yes. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can. can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I I wanted in in the spirit of uh, of Roger Bonnet, I wanted to extend or to remind people that it was a Swiss astronaut Claude Nicolier who did incredible work on the Hubble Early Servicing Mission. So since I once met him, he's a great guy. Uh, we should uh, give him a, a remote thanks. I thought. In fact, if I may add. If I'm not mistaken, Claude Nicolier had joined our talk. He's not online anymore, so he listened to this talk. And uh, so, yes, we will transmit the thanks to him. On this note, before thanking Tom again, let me announce next week's talk again by Jan Tauber from ESA. He will talk about Planck from the early universe to our local environment. Same time, same link. And Tom, thanks again. I mean, Hans and Roger said it. Wonderful talk, wonderful science. Thanks very much for giving this talk to us and the EC audience. Thanks Thank you very much. much. I enjoyed myself. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.